Dave Zirin has written several books. What's my name, fool? Highlighting the activism of Muhammad Ali. Welcome to the Terror Dome and his newest, A People's History of Sports in the U.S. Good. Let's start with a little trivia question here for you guys. I'm going to say a quote and see if you could tell me who said this. I hospitalized a rock. I beat up a brick. I'm so bad I make medicine sick. Who said that? Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. Absolutely. Must be. Here's a second quote. Who said this? Why should they ask me to put on a uniform and go 10,000 miles from home and drop bombs and bullets on brown people in Vietnam while so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs and denied simple human rights? This is the day when such evils must come to an end. I've been warned that to take such a stand would cost me millions of dollars, but I've said it once and I will say it again. The real enemy of my people is here. I'll go to jail. So what? We've been in jail for 400 years. That's also Muhammad Ali. A lot of people know the first Muhammad Ali and don't know the second. See, Muhammad Ali, he was the son of a house painter in Louisville, Kentucky. And he actually came in almost last in his high school class. But he understood something that the best and brightest, so-called, in this country did not understand. He understood that there was a war in Vietnam, and he was against it. He understood that there was prejudice, and he opposed it. And he also understood something that I would argue they desperately try to hide in this country, and that's that sports, this hyper-exalted, brought-to-you-by-Nike platform, this incredible spectacle, could actually be a radical staging ground for dissent. And that's what I write about. Now, I love sports. I'll put that on the table right away. But sports hasn't always necessarily loved me. Um, I grew up, I played every sport, not particularly well, but I played every sport uh, known to woman or man um, or non-gender designation. Um, I, played, I played everything probably except for golf, which I don't think is a sport. Um, and I really do believe that. Oh. Got some plus. I mean, it's just my own personal belief, but I just don't think anything that one can either gain weight or smoke cigarettes while doing is a sport. I think that's got to be our, our basic baseline. Um, but, yeah, I grew up loving sports. I was a total geek about it. I loved I statistics, reading the backs of baseball cards, the whole thing. Uh, but I still saw sports as something entirely separate from politics, and that's the way I always saw it. And I was one of those people just growing up who said, sports and politics don't mix. Sports are where you go as actually a refuge from politics, which I think is probably the dominant view in this country. And that really changed for me back in 1996. I was uh, in college at the time, and there was a basketball player for the Denver Nuggets by the name of Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, born Chris Jackson, a brilliant basketball player. And Chris Jackson, a.k.a. Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, he made the private decision in 1996 that he wasn't going to go out and stand for the national anthem before games. And there were actually several games where he didn't go out and nobody noticed, and he wasn't making a big deal out of it. But a reporter did notice, went back into the locker room and asked him about it. And the reporters asked him, they said, hey, Mahmoud, why aren't you going out there? And he said, look, I just don't, I'm not comfortable with the whole nationalism and the flag and all that in sports. I just don't think those two things should go together. It makes me uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable with regards to my religious beliefs and my personal just moral beliefs. And the reporter, like good reporters do, asked a follow-up and said to him, but Mahmoud, don't you realize that that flag is a symbol of freedom and democracy throughout the world? And it's actually, it's worth going back, I don't know if it's on YouTube, but it's worth going back if you can find it and seeing this interview, because he sort of makes this pause as if he's thinking to himself, should I say it? <laughs> and then he goes, yeah, I'll say it. You can see it in his little wheels turning, and he says, well, it may be a symbol of freedom and democracy to some, but it's a symbol of oppression and tyranny to others. Now, when he said that, it was literally like, Oh my God, sports world just went nuts. I remember watching it at the time. Uh, I was watching ESPN and it was like, Raouf spits on the flag, booyah, din in it, din in it. You know, and this whole pumped up spectacle about what a horrible human being this guy Mahmoud Abdul Raouf was. And I remember watching this like, oh my God, this is a crazy story. And it, it definitely jived with some of my own political sympathies at the time that I saw very separate from sports. And I remember that one of the commentators, one of the talking heads said, Raouf must see himself as one of those activist athletes, you know, like Muhammad Ali or Billie Jean King. 
And I remember hearing that and thinking to myself, wait a minute, activist athletes, what the hell is that? Like I had no idea that such a thing had even existed. And for all my knowledge of sports, my statistical kind of knowledge and who won the Cy Young Award in 1983 and all that stuff, like I had no idea that this other tradition existed. And I tried to find a book that actually encapsulated that tradition of athletes who use this platform to speak about radical dissent. And the book really didn't exist. And so that's really what I've been writing about for some time. And A People's History of Sports in the United States is meant to be that. It's meant to be a book for people who actually want to learn the history of how sports and politics have intersected over the years. And I got to tell you, a lot of what I thought I knew about sports, I really just didn't know. And that was, it was humbling and bracing to actually go back into the history. Like, I had thought, for example, that, uh, you know, Jackie Robinson, for example, was the first African-American player to play Major League Baseball. Not true. Turns out there were African-American players in the majors in the 19th century who were actually forced out of the game as part and parcel with uh, the Jim Crow laws that swept this country. So it's like baseball, like horse racing, like other sports, actually was integrated. And then it was whitened as part of the passing and, and codification of Jim Crow. And learning that was like, oh my God, so there, there were black baseball players and they were actually removed physically from the sport. And then there was this color line that existed. And I thought, okay, well then there's the color line, but then it was Jackie Robinson through his own personal will who integrated the game. I didn't know that in the 1930s there was actually a movement in this country to integrate baseball that was led by the Communist Party press in this country and a writer named Lester Red Rodney. And Lester Rodney actually just passed away this past year, and I was able to interview him at great length for the book. He was, when he died, he was uh, 97, 98 years old. He was uh, sharp as a tack. He was the sports editor of The Daily Worker, their newspaper from 1936 to 1958. And most people are just like, oh my God, Daily Worker had a sports page, and <laughs> it sure did. And Lester Rodney used it as a place for dissent. And just interviewing Lester was great. Like, he was surprised, first of all. Like, I, I sat down with him at this really small, kind of rundown retirement village in Oakland. And he was surprised anybody even would want to hear his stories. And I said, no, I want to hear your stories, and I want to tell them. And he said, wow, ah, to be 80 again, is what he said, <laughs> which was very cute in its way. And he's, and the stories he had were amazing. Like they would do things like little, like little things and big things that made a big difference. Little things like uh, the New York Yankees would have this thing where they would have open tryouts. And he would go down there with African-American prospects and say, open tryouts, let's do it, and actually force the Yankees to try out African-American players who, of course, never made the team. But because baseball's color line was what was known as a gentleman's agreement, it wasn't written down anywhere. It's like so they actually had to do it, and they would go down there with the media to do these kinds of stunts. Or other things they would do as well, small things that made a difference, like uh, a young rookie named Joe DiMaggio was uh, doing a press conference during his, his rookie season, and Lester Rodney was there because he had a press pass, and he would go to all the games, and he was in the locker room, and Joe DiMaggio was asked, like, hey, Joe, who was the best pitcher you ever faced coming up to the big leagues? And Joe DiMaggio, who was not a political person by any account, just answered honestly, and he said, well, I was probably Satchel Paige. Satchel Paige was a Negro League legend. And none of the reporters even published that Joe DiMaggio had said that, except for Lester Rodney. And he not only published that Joe DiMaggio said that, it was huge type like this big. DiMaggio says, Page greatest pitcher, stop the color ban now, exclamation point. And, but then there were big things he did too, because because the, uh, the Communist Party w had a lot of roots in the unions at the time, there would be big May Day or Labor Day parades, and end Jim Crow in baseball became one of the big slogans of the New York and labor movement in other cities as well. And so, so these things that he was able to do to use sports as a platform to fight for integration, I think is a very hidden part of our history. And, and Lester I mean, was a living link to that history, and he's, he's certainly missed. Uh, Jackie Robinson as well. I mean, my father was from Brooklyn. I was born in Brooklyn, and we would, I would go to sleep at night, sometimes very involuntarily, with stories about the Brooklyn Dodgers that he would tell me for over and over again. And the Jackie Robinson story is always the one about the person who, quote unquote, did it the right way. In other words, he kept his mouth shut, he took all kinds of abuse, all kinds of racism, but because he proved his mettle on the field without being some big rabble rouser, he paved the way for integration. Now, the story is, is absolute bunk. I mean, the reality...